Iman Gatsi, Alex Becker, Sam Owens, Russell Branson, and Jordan Welsh. These are some of the most influential creators in the business space. But despite common knowledge, it isn't YouTube money or even their core sales that's gonna make them generationally rich. Because these guys are playing a completely different game. A game with profit margins up to 90%, ability to fully automate fulfillment, and sale multipliers of 4 to 10x of your yearly profits. And this game is called SaaS. SaaS simply stands for Software as a Service. And this business model is the new digital gold rush. Don't believe me? Alex Becker just sold his SaaS platform a few months ago for a staggering $100 million. ClickFunnels hit $160 million in revenue last December. And Iman's business, Agency Flow, is estimated to be valued at over $15 million already. We've also had a very, very low eight-figure offer on it, which, as you can tell, we didn't take. So yeah, all of that is in six months. Now, I know exactly what you're thinking. Lucky them, I could never build a SaaS business because I don't have $200,000 lying around to hire some developers and I don't have three spare years just to learn coding. And look, if this was just a few years ago, you'd be exactly right because it wasn't that long ago that it would have been impossible for you to build a SaaS business without learning how to code, spending over six figures on developers or finding a technical co-founder that would believe in your idea. But what I'm about to share with you today can change the way you look at software development forever and show you that it isn't just the guys at the deep pockets that can play this game today. But before we really get into it, we need to cover some fundamentals to really set the stage for what I'm about to share. Let's jump back to 1883. This is Ada, and she created an algorithm for the analytical engine, which was the first ever programming language. This is what computers looked like back then. Fast forward to 1949, and we've got assembly language. 1970, we've got Pascal, 1987, C++, 1995, JavaScript, and so on and on. This is the evolution of code. And first, we've just had machine code, which was ones and zeros that tell computer what you wanted to do. And second, we had low-level programming languages, which was assembly language that would translate to machine code. Next, we have high-level programming, which is C++, Python, and Ruby. And then low-code, which are visual interface called builders. And you should start to notice a pattern here, because with each iteration of code, it has gotten more and more abstract and easier for the wider majority of people to understand. This means that more people could learn how to code and start developing powerful software. But I didn't mention the reason why you're here in the first place and that is the final evolution on this graph enter no code as the name suggests is basically coding without code it's building the software without worrying about the how and focusing on the what you want to build no code is a movement and a revolution in the digital space that is happening right now with more and more tools coming out every single day most tools give you a drag and drop builder where you can build without any coding just by using logic and connecting things together and you most likely use some no code tools already you've most likely used wix squarespace or shopify these are no code tools tools. Even Google Sheets is considered a no-code tool. However, the difference is, is that over the last few years, we've had some major players enter the game, such as Bubble.io and Webflow. And these companies have received massive funding, so they've been able to grow at a rapid scale, allowing people to build more and more powerful software. Webflow allows you to build pixel-perfect websites, and it's basically like Photoshop, but for website building. They also have now e-commerce and membership functionalities. Well, Bubble is probably one of the most powerful tools that you'll ever see. You know how Shopify is used to build e-commerce stores? Well, Bubble is exactly that, but for software. And the things that you can build with Webflow and Bubble and other no-code tools are absolutely mind-blowing. You can build two-ended marketplaces, such as Airbnb, without any code. You can do it visually, and you can have your app running within a few weeks, depending on your skill level. This would normally take multiple months or thousands of hours, and usually, over six figures if you're hiring developers. And if you don't believe me that Bubble is so powerful, you can listen to these businesses instead as the living proof. Comet, for example, used Bubble.io to build a freelance marketplace, which went to attract 40 million euros in Series A funding round. Scribbly, also built on Bubble, was built in six weeks and got to 30,000 monthly recurring revenue in just one year of operations. And Dividend Finance raised over 384 million and processed over a billion dollars, and this app was also built on Bubble. Now now that you understand what no code is and its true potential, I want to go back to the business model that I was talking about before and explain why it is the new digital gold rush when combined with no code. Yep. First of all, why SaaS? The reason why SaaS businesses are a digital goldmine are threefold. First of all, high profit margins and low cost to entry. 
because of no code. If you take e-commerce business, for example, their typical profit margins are 10 to 15%. So if you make a million dollars worth of revenue, you only get to keep a hundred thousand dollars. Well, in SaaS business, your profit margins can be between 70 to 90%. And that is even possible at scale. So if you make a million dollars, you can keep between 700 to 900 thousand dollars from that. And if you're going to be building this tool yourself using no code, the cost to start this business is going to be very low, just a few hundred dollars to pay for the bubble subscription. The second reason is high leverage and recurring revenue. Once the product is built, it's very easy to scale it because it's a digital product. So you can sell it to as many people as you want and your product fulfillment can be completely automated. And because you're going to go by a subscription model, every single month, your revenue is going to be recurring. And because your revenue is recurring, it's very easy to predict how much you're going to make next month because you can predict exactly how much you're going to make next month. It's very easy to dedicate budget for marketing, hiring your staff and other business decisions. And the last reason, which is the biggest one, is the massive sales multipliers. Most of us don't want to build a business and then run it for the next 30 years. Most people have interests that are always changing. A lot of us don't want to be doing the same thing until we die. And that's why SaaS is so awesome because it's very, very easy to sell and it has very good multipliers. A typical multiplier that you'll often see is about three to five X of your yearly profits. So for example, if your business is generating $200,000 every year in profit, then you can sell for about $600,000 to a million. And in some cases, your multiplier can go over 10x. Now that I've covered the business side and the no code side, I want to show you the exact steps that you can take to start building your SaaS business today. And we are going to break it down into four phases. Now, phase number one is the most crucial phase because that's where your business starts and that's where you really plant the seed. First phase, you really need to immerse yourself in the industry and you can start thinking about the problems that arise there and the problems that you can potentially solve. The founder of Dividend Finance, for example, knew how complicated loan applications can be for home improvement. He saw a gap in the market and he built a tool that made it simple for you to make loan applications as an individual customer. Once you really think about your industry and you come up with an idea that you can solve, start asking yourself these questions. How big is the market for your idea? How can you make it better? What pain points can you solve? What will your solution provide? And will your solution save someone time? or will it save somebody money? Once you're done with that, you have your idea, you've answered these questions, you're pretty clear on what problem you wanna solve, then you wanna start carrying out interviews. And you wanna carry out those interviews with the people in the industry. You can either connect to these people at different networking events, or you can interview your colleagues. And when you interview them, you just wanna ask them about the problems that they run into, how often they run into them, and what solutions they've tried to use before. Now, the important thing here is not to mention that you're building some kind of app, because they're gonna give you biased answers. They're gonna tell you, oh, I'd love this, I'd love this, I'd love this feature. And that can be very misleading. So your mission here is literally just understanding the problem and that's it. So here you want to carry out as many interviews as possible to really build a clear picture of what problems there are and how you can solve them. And in this phase, you might also want to build good relationship with the people that you interview because these people can be your first customers once you actually launch your product. Now we move on to phase two, which is the MVP stage. MVP simply stands for minimal viable product. And here we just need to create the minimum viable product. So that can be a simple landing page that makes it look like your service is already running, like your business is fully operational, right? And we're just doing this to basically prove our concept. One of the best ways to do it is to build out a landing page and have an email capture form so you can run traffic to it and see where the people are interested. And if you capture those emails, you can later notify those people that the product is actually out and that they can purchase it. So build a simple landing page, you can use card, software, Webflow, whatever option you decide, it's not too important. Make sure that it's clear what your offer is and then run some traffic to it. If you have an audience already, you can also send that to them to gauge whether there is interest in the problem that you're trying to solve and your solution. Now, once you've finished that, you've run the traffic, you prove the concept, now you can actually start building out the tool. And for that, I really recommend using bubble.io because of that, you can build out your entire SaaS product and scale it for a very long time. If you really wanna build something massive, then in some cases, you might want to use Bubble just for the MVP stage. And then once you prove the concept, hire actual developers. But 90% of cases, you can use Bubble to run your entire business and to scale it to the moon. Think about the businesses that I mentioned before. And now we're on to phase three, which is scale. Here we have quite a few options. They are organic marketing, SEO, partnerships, and doing paid ads. Paid ads would be the quickest option because you launch your ads and then you get traffic straight to your page and potentially some sales. However, it is usually the most 
expensive option. And another issue is that once you turn off your ads, your traffic is gone. So the best option is to do organic marketing. So it's making videos like this, long form content, so helping people solve some kind of issue, providing them value and selling them your product. If you're really good in your industry and you're solving a very important problem, then it shouldn't be long until people discover your product and purchase it. SEO is a great option once you have some capital to hire an expert because it also takes time to grow and usually need a bit more experience than the YouTube videos. As YouTube videos, you just basically give out value and people will watch the videos and share it with others. Partnerships can also be very powerful if you find some influencers that have high authority in the niche. Usually you give them an upfront payment for a promotion of your product. And in some cases, you also give them a percentage from each sale. There's hundreds of thousands of influencers out there that have traffic but don't necessarily have their own product. So if you have a really good product and something that they believe in, usually they'll promote it. But all of the guys that I mentioned at the start of this video are actually getting sales to the SaaS platform through educational products. Iman, for example, sells his SMMA course and then most people who go through his course will most likely buy his SaaS product as well because they already trust him and they have history with him then why would they go for any other product? And you can see that in many, many SaaS businesses, they'll sell some kind of education product. And then from there on, they will sell a SaaS product. And the way that you can do that is to make a cheap course in your niche, maybe like 30 to $50, sell that, and then sell your SaaS to those same customers. The really awesome thing here is that you can use your education product to offset the acquisition cost. So for example, you're running paid traffic and it costs you 30 to $50 to acquire each customer. The course can completely offset that course. And then you're technically getting free customers for your SaaS product. And as I mentioned again, all the most successful players in this niche are doing this. So really consider it. And phase four is evolve. For every sale that you get, make sure that you listen to the customer feedback. So whenever they tell you that they need a certain feature, really listen to that. Or they tell you that something is broken, try to fix it as fast as possible. For example, I was listening to an episode recently from my first $1 million YouTube channel. I don't remember the exact name, um, but the guy was mentioning how there was this product that he was using for his, for his newsletter. And it was a new product, right? So it had quite a few issues. And But as he was using that product, he was actually mentioning those issues to the CEO himself. And then he would go and implement those changes as soon as possible. And at first it was good, but I kept running into these limitations and I would be like, hey, oh my God, they don't even let you uh, filter by X or, you know, like I, I would find these, I'd bump into the limitations because it was very early on. We were like one of their first users, I think. And what they would do is either he would manually do a workaround for us. He would take three hours and just make my life better. He would also ask me a bunch of questions like, so what are you trying to really do here? And, uh, let me just confirm I understand this. Like a good product person would do. He's trying to really understand the needs. The second thing he would do is then they would actually ship the feature. So over the course of about three or four months, I was like, change my mind, call Tyler. We need to invest in this thing. That's a great example of evolving your product and just really focusing on your customer experience. Because if you keep doing this, eventually your product is going to become simply amazing. Like if you listen to all the feedback, you fix issues as soon as they arise, and then you introduce like the features that are really crucial and that the customers really want, then your product is just going to kill the competition. One example of that could also be Adobe, right? Actually, the software has been so buggy that it basically became a meme in the industry that your Adobe, Adobe is always going to crash and, and the infamous media pending screen. But recently they've been listening to the feedback and they've really been focusing on optimization. So I could see a lot of people who were thinking to switch to other software deciding to stay here. And one mistake people make here is that they just focus on the features. They just like, they go to their competitors and they try to just pump the software full of different features. People much rather have a perfectly working product that does what they need than a product that doesn't work but has a billion features that they don't use. Simple as that. And that's another awesome thing about no code. You don't need to wait for the developers to make changes. Changes, you can instead just jump on bubble yourself, make the changes that are necessary and publish the new version of the app all by yourself at rapid speed. So that was it on the digital gold rush. I'll see you in the next one.